thank God for Jesus. I so honor and reverence the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah to the Lamb. There was a sleep study that found that the time that we spend dreaming actually helps the human mind to overcome painful experiences. God has a purpose in giving us dreams. Dreams give us power. Goals give us focus, but dreams give us power. Norman Cousins says that people are never more insecure than when they become obsessed with their fears at the expense of their dreams. Don't ever let your fears cause your dreams to commit suicide. God has given you dreams to empower you, showing you what already awaits you if you'll remain wholly faithful unto him. And the process of reaching your dream is just like reaching a destination using a GPS, a global positioning system. It's just like taking one of those devices if it knows where you are and if you tell it where you want to go then what it will do is that it will create a map for you. Uh, Henry Kaiser uh, founded, you know, Kaiser Permanente and some other businesses but he said that the evidence is overwhelming that you cannot begin to achieve your best unless you set some aim in life. You gotta set some aim in life or you'll never be able to achieve your best. Set some aim. There has to be some, some purpose, some focus given to your life. And, and here's what you have to know. If you're going to parallel this with your dream, you've got to create a, a global positioning system. I, I, I like to say that the GPS is a God positioning system. And so you have to know this, number one, your present position. You've got to know your present position. A GPS will not work for you if you don't know where you are. You have to have a point of origin. If, if you don't know where you are or if you think that you're in one place but you're actually in another, then your directions will be off. You'll be misguided. God does not give you directions based on where you think you are. God gives you directions based on where you are. So you have to ask yourself because you've got to know your present position. You've got to ask yourself this, where am I? Where am I? Before God can help you. Remember after Adam had messed up, one of the first questions that came to Adam is, Adam, where art thou? Do you think that God was asking Adam because Adam was really honestly hiding from God? When God asks a question, please understand he is never asking so that he can gather information. God is omniscient. He already knew where Adam was. That's why Adam could hear his voice. Adam. God knew where Adam was. God asked Adam the question so that the question that was posed to Adam would create an awakening in Adam. So I want to ask you some questions so that the same question that God asked Adam will create an awakening for you because you cannot activate the God positioning system until you first know where you are. You must know where your present position is. Where am I? Where am I spiritually? Am I spiritually ready for this blessing to come into my life? If God gave you your dream right now, I mean, if God gave most people, uh, you know, the lottery money, it, you know, they, they wind up less like another statistic because they, they don't have the spiritual endowment to be able to handle it. It might cause them to backslide. You have to ask yourself, where am I spiritually? Where am I financially? Where am I financially? You, you gotta ask yourself, you gotta locate yourself. Where am I physically? Where am I physically? Am I physically uh, able to do this? You know, when you get ready to launch a business, you got to be physically able to run, burn some shoe leather. I mean, you, you're going to have to get up early in the morning and sometimes work late at night. You got to ask yourself, do I have the physical endurance to do this? Do I have the physical endurance to do this? Where am I physically? Where am I emotionally? Where am I emotionally? Am I an emotional basket case? Because, you know, if your emotions are torn up, you know, you can't run a business and be fulfilling your dreams and you crying one minute and trying to wipe your nose, you know, because you start thinking about somebody that hurt you and said something badly to you and they left you and rejected you and now you at work trying to function and you, you're in front of a client saying, excuse me, excuse me. I had a lady that came to me some years ago to interview for a job and had an emotional meltdown in my office. 
And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to hire you. You're an emotional basket cake. Get yourself together. <laughs> and she, she's there for a job interview. She turned it into a pastoral counseling situation. I'm like, you know, you're here to get a job, but sweetheart, you know, where are you emotionally? Are you emotionally ready uh, for, for what God is, is trying to do in your life? Are you emotionally ready for this thing? Are you relationally ready? Are you relationally ready? I had a guy that came to me one time, and he asked me, he said, uh, he said, God has told me to start a church. First thing that I asked him, I said, how does your wife feel about it? He said, when the doctor tell the truth, he said, she ain't with it. I said, if she ain't with it, you don't be with it. Because you're going to need it. You're going to need her help. You're going to need everything that she can offer to you. You will never be able to build this thing successfully if you're pulling against dead weight in your own house. I says, don't even do it. Relationally, I said, you're not ready to do that. You're not ready to do it until you have the relational support that you need. There are certain things that you get ready to do. You need relational support. When a man gets ready to launch a business, he needs his wife to believe in him. I mean, if nobody else believes him, he needs her to believe in him. I mean, if a wife has a vision in her heart, uh, she needs her husband to believe in him. My God, if you can't get the folks that live with you, who are supposed to love you, to believe in you, who will believe in you? So you need, uh, where are you relationally? Where are you intellectually or mentally? Do I know uh, enough stuff to, to start this or am I so ignorant? And I don't mean that in an unwise way, but I mean, am I lacking the knowledge to be able to make me successful in this so that I would waste a lot of time, energy, effort, money because I just lack the know-how of knowing what to do in order to make this thing work. You've got to you know, do your homework, you've got to study. Where are you mentally? You've got to really understand your present position, not where you want to be. You, you can get your eyes so glazed about where you want to be, but you've got to have a reality check and ask yourself, where am I spiritually, financially, physically, emotionally, relationally, intellectually? Where am I? Where am I? So right now. And so just like you get your car serviced, if you're getting ready to go on a long trip, you don't want to take a car and, and then get out there and then part of your engine falls out on you. You have to take your car, you want to get, make sure you've got an oil change and a tune-up or whatever on your car. You want to make sure that certain things are checked out because you don't want any surprises on the side of the road. You give your car a checkup before you start the journey. That's why you have to ask yourself, where am I? Where am I? So that, because you don't want to break down, you want to make sure that you are holistically ready for the journey. Ask that question. Where am I? Where is your current position? Just think of this thing that you got to apply the GPS analogy to your dream. Where am I? Where am I? Here's the second thing. You got to know your future position. Your future position. And, and, and that is, what will my dream look like when I achieve it? You know, I like the thing that they've done so well with Google Maps. You get to the end thing, they got an actual picture of the place. They, they show you a picture of the destination. So you got to be able to have a, a picture of your future position that, that if you were to have your dream, what does your dream look like? If you don't know what it looks like, you won't recognize it when it comes. So what will your dream look like when you have achieved it? What will it look like? And you dream elaborately and vivid color in detail and describe that. Here's the third thing that you need to know of the positions in between. The positions in between. Your present position, and your future position. But you know, you can't just make, go from the present to the future in one giant leap. There are a lot of in-between steps. So when you're following a GPS, I mean, it'll tell you go 3.2 miles and turn left on such and such. And in 200 feet, you're gonna make it right. And so you've got to know those in-between position, the positions in between. What steps must I take to get from my present position to my future position? because you must set a series of small goals in order to get to where you want to go. You've got to set a series of small goals. Those are the turn-by-turn -turn direction. Setting goals is the first step in turning the invisible into the visible. You need to know, this is what we're working on, is taking the invisible that we have within us and turning it into the visible. Setting goals is the first step in turning the invisible into the visible. Now the difference between a GPS and you 
is that you have to create your own map and your own turn-by-turn -turn directions. You've got to create that yourself. There's not going to be something that's going to spit that out for you. You've got to create it for yourself. Now, if somebody else has gone down a similar road, and, and if they've done it in an organized fashion, you can find out for them some of the steps that they took. That, listen, you're going to have to go to the, you know, uh, to the State Department, Secretary of the State, and you're going to have to get a, a file for a business license, and you're going to have to do this. And they can take you down certain logistical roads that you're going to have to go. Go down and, and follow somebody who's already been in a certain place, because have you ever ask for directions to go to a certain place and, and then a person said, well, uh, you know what that uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken is? You're going to see that over on the left. So you know where that big Walmart is? It's going to be over, you know, and they'll, they'll give you a landmark. See, you, you get a landmark from somebody who's already been that journey. And so if there are certain things that you, you'll have to find people that can identify particular places that are your in-betweens. It's not your final destination, but it's a place that's on the way there to let you know you're going down the right road. I like it when people give me landmarks because at least when I see the landmark, it confirms to me I'm on the right road. Have you ever been driving someplace and you sort of getting this, everything and looking strange and like, well, now I don't know about this. And I really know that I'm in the country. I, I was in the country one time and, and they told me that I was going to see a big rock. <laughs> and I was supposed to turn left at the big rock. I, I, and, I, and you know, I'm like, at the big rock. I mean, what's the address? It's at the corner of which two streets? Where is the closest major intersection? And then they, they, they gave me a direction. And they said, you're going to see a, uh, you know, a, a house that was burned down, and the only thing that's out there is a chimney. You, I, I mean, I'm like, I knew that I was in the sticks then. I mean, I'm like, I, you, I, I'm going to see a chimney? <laughs> I mean, that, that, you know, you're going to see a red building over to the, you know. When they can't even give you a name and they just got to start giving you, you're going to see a, a windmill. They're going to be a well over there at, at, this, at this house. You're going to see a white house and there are going to be some dogs and some chickens around there. See, I knew I was in the country then. But you've got to have some things that identify some things to you in these positions that are in between, in between your present position and your future position of where the fulfillment of the dream is. You see, uh, Dick Biggs said that your dream is a general idealistic view of where you would like to go, but your goals are specific, realistic declarations of how you are going to get there. Now let me be the first to admit to you that setting realistic goals is not as easy as it sounds. It's not as easy as it sounds. May I tell you something that uh, filmmaker George Lucas said? He said setting realistic goals is one of the hardest things to do because you don't always know exactly where you're going. And he said, and you shouldn't. He said, for me, just setting the goals of getting decent grades in school and taking subjects that I had some interest in was a big goal. And he said, and I focused on that. But every dream requires wisdom. And it is wisdom that produces a strategy, and it is the strategy that yields success. But every dream is going to require some wisdom. And then I want you to know something that Peter Drucker, who's considered to be the father of modern management, he stated this, that strategic planning is necessary precisely because we cannot forecast. He says strategic planning does not deal with future decisions, it deals with the futurity of present decisions. Decisions exist only in the present. The question that faces the st strategic decision maker is not what his organization should do tomorrow. The question is this, what do we have to do today to be ready for an uncertain tomorrow? That's the question. What do we have to do today to be ready for an, uh, an uncertain uh, tomorrow? That's what you have to start start thinking about. You know, uh, serving as manager of information system for our company for 10 years, I had to do disaster recovery planning. I couldn't wait until a flood or some storm had come and knocked some stuff out. So I always backed stuff up and kept stuff at off locations in case everything was wiped out. I wasn't, they didn't fool me with Y2K. Did everything you think, the people that owed us money, that I wasn't going to be able to find it. Oh, I had it backed up. 
I had a hard copy and I had electronic copies. And I was going to send them a fresh bill. <laughs> they weren't going to fool me. I mean, you know, listen, I mean, I'm like, listen, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. But let me caution you here. I mean, even though the, the strategic thinking, it's, it's, it's about the uncertainty, making decisions right now that prepare us for some of the uncertainties that we will face tomorrow. And you have to think through all of the various ramifications so that you are prepared. The future belongs to those who prepare for it. Belongs to those who prepare for it, not the ones who just live today and say, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. You have to live your life with intentionality. You have to prepare for some things. Uh, let me caution you here and say that if a strategy doesn't work, change it. If a strategy doesn't work in your life, change it. Don't be afraid to change a strategy that is not working. It, you should never become enamored with a strategy. Become enamored with results, but not the strategy. Don't marry yourself to a strategy. If the strategy is no longer producing, change it. Change it. I know that you thought that you're going to do this, but there's some things that you can think in your mind are going to work really great, and in reality, it just doesn't work, and people don't respond to it. Change it. Change it. You have to be willing to make some changes in your strategies because we want results. So don't marry yourself to a strategy and, and, uh, and be stubbornly unrelenting about making the necessary changes. So if what you're doing, the way that you're doing it, is not working, then change it. But remember here, the key number one is to decide where you want to go. Decide where you want to go. Jesus said, what things soever you desire, you'd be surprised how many people are not clear on what they, de they desire. You can discover that when you go into a restaurant and the waitress comes to the table and asks them what they want and they're just looking up and down. I went to one restaurant, they had 500 items on the menu. Five hundred items. I, I, asked, I said, y'all got all this stuff in the kitchen. <laughs> That's a lot of inventory to put up with. I mean, it, it really, it, they had 500 items on, on the, on the uh, menu, and I really wanted to give them some suggestions because I said a whole lot of this stuff is very mediocre on here. You ought to cut out maybe 480 and put 20 things that you know how to do good. <laughs> but remember now, to change from where you are, to change from where you are, you must decide where you'd rather be. There are too many people that are in one particular place and they're complaining about the place that they are but they have not described where they'd rather be. You can't change where you are until you decide where you'd rather be. There's no need in cursing the darkness unless you've already learned how to light a candle. So you can't change from where you are until you decide where you'd want to be. Here's key number two. Start where you are with what you have. Start where you are with what you have. And the question is this, what do you have? What do you have? I want you to ask yourself that question. What do, what do I have? When you're talking about making the invisible visible, you have to ask yourself, number one, where am I? Number two, uh, what do I have? What do I, what do I have? What do I have? What do I have? I want you to think about the fact that you have an idea. God gives everybody an idea. God gives an idea. God just gives you an idea. That idea can change your life. There is nothing more powerful in all of the world then an idea whose time has come is what Victor Hugo said. An idea. If he gives you an idea. Do you have an idea? And if you don't have an idea, get on your face before God and say, God, give me a God idea. A God, not a good idea, a God idea. Give me a God idea. A God idea. Just get a God idea. You get you a, a God idea, it'll change the world. You know, so, but get a God idea. And remember, when you get a God idea, the idea is bigger than the place. It might start in your basement. It might start in your garage. But the idea is bigger than your garage. It's always bigger than the place. Remember that. Steve Jobs started stuff in the garage. But the idea that he had was bigger than the garage. The idea is bigger than the person. The man, Steve Jobs, is gone now. But the idea is still living, isn't it? Still living. Because the idea is bigger than a person. Bigger than the place. Bigger than the person. And, and it's even bigger than a product. Because now the thing that's really making them so much money is not even all of their computers and their little iPods that they started off with. They didn't start off with an iPhone. They started off with a computer. Then they're the one, they have revolutionized the way that music is delivered to the world. It's amazing. And all of this stuff started with an idea. May I just tell you this? Not all of the ideas have been thought up yet. 
God has reserved some just for you. Just for you. Just for you. I want you to get yours. You ought to say, you know, God, I mean, if you ever go on a fast, turn down your plate. Listen, I mean, I'm just telling you, if you get a God idea, if you get a God idea, if you get a God idea, I'm just telling you, just a God idea. And you can have something that God gave you, and you might need just a God idea to even take it to the next level. I tell you, just like one restaurant, they were serving about 200 customers a morning serving pancakes. Somebody came to them and they told them this. So you got a formula, you can serve 200 people a day here. But then they said, box it. Box it. The next thing you know, Aunt Jemima's pancake mix was boxed and put on grocery stores across the country. May I tell you that they start serving more people pancake than the 200 people that were coming to their restaurant? Because somebody came by there and gave them an idea. An idea. They did that with the, with the soda folks. Because somebody came and gave them two words was a God idea. Bottle it. Because at one point, some of you all may be old enough to remember, when you couldn't buy a soda in a bottle, it was always at a fountain. You had to go to an, a fountain. Anybody remember that? Anybody old enough to remember sodas coming out of a fountain? You had to go down to the fountain and they'd fill them up. You couldn't go to a drink machine. There was no soda machine. It was a fountain. And somebody came and gave them two words, bottle it, multiplied them, turned that thing into a multi-billion dollar, uh, you know, industry. Just by two little words. Do you know that God has reserved an idea for you? There are certain things that God hides from you, but there are other things that he hides for you. He hides for you. You, 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 what do you have? What do you have? You got an idea. You know what else you're going to need beyond, beyond an idea? You're going to need a team. It's got to be more than just you. You need a team. Who do you have to help you? Start, start thinking about what do you have? Who do you have to help you? No man is an island unto himself is what John Doan said. You got to learn how to build a team. Make friends. Talk to people. It'll help your ideas even to multiply. You know what? Another thing that you have and that you don't even realize it? You got a deadline. You're not going to live forever. You got a deadline. Let, let, let me just tell you, you have the ability to place a deadline on yourself even when you don't have one because a deadline creates urgencies. There's a lot of folks who can't get certain things done until they have a de deadline. Isn't it amazing? You give a kid an assignment in school and they can have three months. You can give it at the beginning of the semester and three days before the paper's due. Day and a half before the paper, the night before the paper is due. It doesn't matter, you know. But see, it's because the deadline, the deadline, some people can't do the work until they are under last minute pressure. I know several people that do some of their best work under last minute pressure. Put a deadline on yourself. Put the pressure and create the urgency yourself to say, you know what, it may not be due until the next month, but you, know, you just say, what, I got to have this done by Monday night. Monday night, I got to have this finished. Finito. It's got to be finished. Monday. You can put a deadline on something. You got more stuff than what you realize. What else do you have? You have to start taking inventory. What do you have? You got an idea? You know, you got a, a team that you can pull together. You, you've got deadlines that you can impose on yourself. There is creativity that you've got. Creativity, creativity. More than you can shake a stick at. Albert Einstein said this, that imagination is more important than knowledge. Albert Einstein said that, brilliant mind, said imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination, just your, your ability to be creative. We are made in the image of Elohim, creator God. Elohim, creator God. You know, another thing that you got, you got opportunities. Now, some of you all are just sitting back waiting on certain other opportunities. But may I just remind you that opportunities multiply as opportunities are seized. Take the little opportunities and then the bigger ones will come. You got to walk through little doors when nobody knows you. Well, you don't even have a reputation. How do you think you create a reputation? You get enough little people to know you. Somebody start talking about you. And somebody that, 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 that little knows somebody big. And then they'll, they'll refer you and say, you know what, I know so-and-so. They got this and this ought to go in your chain store here. You'll be surprised who knows who. Some people have, may have married into a family. You may be talking to somebody that might be the black sheep of the family. But they can talk to their relative and hook, give you a hookup. I'm just telling you, you don't ever know there are opportunities beyond your wildest imagination. What opportunities currently exist for you? You have to create future opportunities by serving somebody else's dream. You can create opportunities yourself sometime by going and helping somebody else who's doing something similar to what you're called to do. And you'd be surprised how you can create opportunities for yourself. Mark Twain suggested this. He said that the secret of getting ahead is getting started. 
And the secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks and then starting on the first one. I think it's got a pretty good little system there. But the real difference, the real difference between a dream and wishful thinking is what you do day to day. Is what you do day to day. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You have to make an intentional effort to do a little something every day toward your dream. A little something every day toward your dream. I don't care whether it's studying, uh, it's, uh, you know, Googling something on the internet, whether it's journaling, whether it's sending an email, whether it's writing a letter, whether it's talking to a mentor, whether it's working on a proposal, whether it is honing your craft, whether it's praying about it, whether it's building relationships with somebody. Work on your dream. Do a little bit every day working and building. Whatever you do every day, you focus on that thing, it keeps it in the forefront of your mind, and whatever you focus on gets stronger and it expands. It expands. If you start working in the area of your dream every day, a little bit every day, that's the way that you forge something that can become incredibly great in your life, just by doing a little bit of it every single day. And if you do right things day after day, you will make progress and you will eventually achieve what you set out to do. You will eventually achieve everything that you set out to do. Remember that a dream now is, is not what you see in sleep. Dream is the things that you have that won't let you sleep. It's the thing that keep interrupting your sleep. It's the thing that will wake you up in the night and talk to you. And it began to show you things. It will begin to show you things and and then you'll have to realize that there's something that God has for me. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where revelation is power, power for living.